to pass the baton of continuity announcing to my close personal friend and colleague, Mr. Stephen Urquhart. Have yourself a fantastic weekend and keep it for extra because we have plenty to come. Indeed we do. Thank you, Wes. Have a good weekend yourself. Good morning. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra, Saturday morning, the 27th of June. Hello, I'm Steve Urquhart. BBC Radio 4 Extra. Six o'clock and we've drama coming next based on a ghost story. But not just any ghost story. It's been called the most authenticated ghost story of all time. Patricia Hodge stars in Miss Morrison's Ghosts in just a moment. And later this morning we'll explore the life, or should that be lives, of Sir Alec Guinness. Dark Horse and Alec Guinness Archive is with Alistair McGowan and that's at eight. Ian Curtis has written lots of drama, especially for TV. You might remember the Falklands play, which was controversially shelved for more than 15 years and finally broadcast in 2002. But what we're about to hear is quite different to that. Miss Morrison's Ghosts is based on the actual accounts of two English Oxford academics. It tells of the paranormal events experienced by two women in the gardens of the Palace of Versailles in France one afternoon in August 1901. When the women returned to Oxford and started discussing it, their academic careers and aims for equal recognition for women were detrimentally affected. In our drama, the two women are Miss Morrison, played by Patricia Hodge, and Miss Lamont, by Juliet Stevenson. Which of you ladies is Miss Lamont? I am Miss Lamont. The principal's compliments. And would you kindly rejoin the trustees in the senior common room? Certainly. They regret to have taken so long in their deliberations. Miss Morrison's Ghosts by Ian Curtis with Patricia Hodge as Miss Morrison and Juliet Stevenson as Miss Lamont. Miss Lamont. Please sit down. Thank you. <clears throat> the trustees are pleased to inform you that they are able to offer you the position of vice principal of this college. Oh. But, but surely... Th yes? The position I applied for was that of principal. My fellow trustees are not yet prepared to offer you that position. Certainly, I intend to retire as principal, and my fellow trustees will then appoint a successor, but they are not prepared to make that appointment today. I see. Mr. Hodgson did not explain this. <clears throat> I'm very sorry, Miss Lamont. Um, when I suggested that you apply for the position, the possibility that there might be an interim stage had not been suggested. However, the trustees have a suggestion. It is that you should accompany me on an educational expedition I'm undertaking to Paris next week. We may become better acquainted thereby, and perhaps the more senior appointment may follow after due consideration. You agree? W well, yes. <sighs> On the site of a hunting lodge of Louis XIII, it was decided to build a magnificent palace. Versailles has been called the greatest palace of France. In the main courtyard, which slopes upwards from the gates, stand statues of Richelieu and other famous... Too hot. 
Oh, what? Uh, to listen to all that. Oh, very good, Miss Morrison. Uh, we read it when we get back to the hotel. Well, if it's too hot here by the palace, perhaps the shade of the trees over there by the Trianons might be more agreeable. Uh, yes, yes. If there is a breeze, we'll find it there. Trianons, did you say? Yes, the two Trianons. Uh, Marie Antoinette's private chateaus. I'm not sure I can walk that far. I, um, I must sit down. Oh, uh, let's hire a carriage. There's, there's no need to walk. <coughs> um, uh, excusez-moi. Uh, easy. Too sweet. Uh, mais bien sûr, madame. It's magnificent! <laughs> Did you say there were two Trianons? Indeed, yes, yes. And, and the little one is said to be even more charming. Just through the trees, mm. over there. That must be the gate. Oh, it is cool here. Shall we walk? See, we'll play! <laughs> Not much cooler. <sighs> C'est combien? À votre discrétion, madame. Merci. Nous marchons maintenant. Merci. I see no reason why the number of students we admit should not be increased to 80 within two years. 80? Does the college have the accommodation? Oh, certainly we do. Our present complement of 60 scarcely strains our resources. And you will recall the plans for the, uh, the new Hall of Residence. Oh, oh. oh. <sighs> Miss Lamont. Miss Lamont. I'm here. I'm here. Uh. Oh. I, I, I don't understand the heat. Shall I try this path? I, 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 I'm not sure it's right. Uh, here come two men. Let's ask them. Men? Here, you see, gardeners. Ask them. Ask them. Excusez-moi, monsieur. C'est bien la route pour... Tout droit. Tout droit. Tout droit. What did they say, Miss Lamont? I don't understand. Where is our way? Haven't you got the map? Look. Look! That man! By the steps! Looking at us. Evil. Evil. Look at his face. I think he's blind. And his face. Surely. Surely those marks. Smallpox scars. Hideous. Which is our way? What? There's no one. Miss Morrison? Madame, madame, il ne faut pas passer par là. Par ici, chercher la maison. Là, là. Uh, merci. Did you see what he was wearing? He was wearing a theatrical costume. A period coat, a costumious. Where are these people? I... I don't know. I can hear them, but... Oh, look. Look at her. What? That lady is sketching. I see no one. There. See? By the terrace. How elegant she is. Look, she's turning. She's looking at us. Where? Straight at us. She sees us. 
suppose they were, those people? At the Petit Trianon? Yes. I was going to discuss that when you'd finished your letter. We will discuss it now. Now. Well, I thought that perhaps there was to be a fancy dress parade or, or, or a tableau vivant. But the oppression, the sense of evil. Was that not the heat? Though they wore such heavy 18th century clothing. Perhaps they were rehearsing a play. Ah. Uh. I'll post your letter for you, Miss Morrison, when you're finished. Shall I order you some tea? You saw the dairy. Do you mean the, the woman with a large jug and the little girl with her arms raised? The dairy, the dairy, yes. Why did they not move? It was as if they were frozen. I remember most clearly the evil-looking man by the little temple. His pockmarked face. Oh. Oh. Oh, that curious little rustic bridge. It was as if it was painted on canvas. Mm. The woman sketching by the steps, most remarkable. What woman? By the terrace, the steps of the Petit Trianon. Oh, but I saw no one. She was in full costume, full 18th century clothes, sketching and holding out her work to look like this. She turned to look at us. I, 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 I don't... Miss Lamont, we passed right by her. We could have touched her. She was as close to us as you are to me now. Oh, yes, yes, of, of, of course, yes. Though what I remember most was the sense of evil. And the music. The brass band. Oh, no, this was quite different. Most curious. Mm hmm. You don't suppose... Do you suppose that what we saw was... that they were in some way... I think perhaps we should write separate accounts of this afternoon, just as we remember it. Well, surely it's enough to discuss it. That is the one thing we must not do. It could be of, of some scientific interest. Very well, Miss Morrison. Ah, no, milk, milk. Tell him I want milk in my tea. Madame Verdoulet, dans son thé, s'il vous plaît. Verdoulet. <sighs> oh, oui, madame, de tout de suite. I've had milk in my tea every single morning in this wretched hotel. He said he'd bring it immediately. Yes, 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 I understood that. Your account doesn't mention the sketching lady. I didn't see her. But you agreed last night. I was wrong to agree. Surely it's of importance that we saw different things. I, for instance, saw the plough. The what? The plough. For ploughing the fields. You do not mention it. I did not see it. I find it of interest that the route we took on which our own sketch maps agree does not appear in Baedeker's guide. What? Look, our paths don't appear on the printed version at all. See? Quite different. Perhaps we were mistaken. Both of us? Mistaken in the same way? What other reason could there be? I can't imagine. Miss Morrison, I don't think we should pursue this any further. Indeed? And why not? It is a case of confused evidence due to the heat. Any other explanation could be thought... Well... Unchristian. Unchristian? Pray, what could you mean by that? Well, uh, I suppose... May I remind you that you are addressing the daughter of the Bishop of Salisbury? You dare suggest 
that I could harbour unchristian sentiments to explain perfectly natural events. What on earth can you mean? Psychic explanations are sometimes... Psychic? Really, Miss Lamont, I don't expect the romances of the nursery tea table from you. Nevertheless, we should perhaps make some further investigations. You should return to Versailles this afternoon. To make quite certain, Baedeker is mistaken. Oh, but I don't think... I, I must return to Oxford for the senior common room before term begins, but as your principal, I give you three further days' leave of absence in Paris. Very well, Miss Morrison. Telegraph me, should you find anything of interest. I shall write, Miss Morrison. A letter will meet you from Paris soon enough. And I am happy to report that Miss Lamont seems an excellent female, worthy to follow me as principal of this college. <laughs> that her father rose no higher than a rural dean should not be held against her. I therefore propose that we formally confirm her appointment. Uh, to commence when, principal? Immediately. Oh. Oh, I'm sure we're grateful to the Reverend Mr Hodgson for bringing her availability to uh, our attention. Well, uh, thank you. We should not otherwise have known of her existence. Uh, principal, we have in the past discussed a period of overlap, of handing over of office. One term. I see no reason why Miss Lamont should not remain as vice principal for one term to learn the ropes, uh, with uh, appropriate adjustment in salary. And become principal on your retirement? Should we not write to her to propose this? Not necessary, Registrar. But surely we should formalise... She will the... accept it. <sighs> Nevertheless, I think we should write. It seems to me quite clear that on the day we saw those queer people, we were either mistaken as to the route we took, or we followed paths which it is no longer possible to follow. Though how... Or why this can be, I, I, I do not know. For example, I recall we took the right-hand turning after passing the two officials. Your sketch map confirms this. Instead of a thickly wooded area, we observed, there are gravel paths and neat lawns. Also, the temple we saw no longer exists. Exactly where you describe your lady sitting and sketching, there are large rhododendrons of many years' growth. Is it enigmatic, sir? And she was reprimanded and gated for one week. Miss Newham failed to attend morning prayers on the 10th without excuse and was fined two shillings. Yeah. Lady Rose Taylor was fined one shilling and sixpence for failing to wear a hat whilst bicycling in Beaumont Street. <sighs> Miss Walker was fined five shillings for using inappropriate appropriate language to a fellow student at the breakfast table. And this catalogue of infamy all took place in the final week of last term? Yes, Principal. Congregation must regard us as a bevy of harpies and loose women. May I once again remind those around the table who are responsible for discipline that whilst our petition to join the university is being considered, we shall be subject to the most rigorous scrutiny. There are those seeking any excuse to reject it. Oh, I, 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 Do you really think so? I'm afraid that is the case. The general atmosphere of congregation is markedly unsympathetic. I myself feel... If that should happen, I should, of course, continue in office until we are accepted by the university. But, but, but your successor... Miss Lamont would agree with that. She is, I'm glad to say, a sensible woman. I have no text this morning. None is necessary. For the last 20 years that I have been principal of this place, we have worked, strived, toiled for one thing and one thing alone. For that day when the university would finally embrace us as a college equal to the men's colleges. When Lord Kedleston himself would confer our charter and we would become, at last, 
part of the most venerable seat of learning in the Empire. That is why Miss Lamont will need the prayers of all of us. For the past decade, she has been headmistress of an excellent school for young ladies near Watford. She is the daughter of a rural dean, but as my father, the Bishop of Salisbury, would say, those with least experience sometimes flourish best. Every male eye in Oxford will be upon us, scrutinizing, examining, scouring for any excuse to deny us this recognition. And why? Because we are women. Women. How dreadful, they cry. Women at Oxford, women seeking degrees, women attending lectures, women seeking higher education. As serious scholars and philosophers, women cannot matter. What can a woman offer to scholarship? But we do matter. We do. I went to the office of the Superintendent of Works at Versailles. He was positive there had been no play or tableau vivant or anything of that nature on the day we were there. Cinematograph filming? Nothing. And there is the strictest control of such things. I inquired about the green uniforms of those officials that we saw. Uh, the two gardeners? Uh, surely they were officials. Gardeners, gardeners. Well, whatever they were, he emphatically denied their existence. When I insisted that the, the men in long green coats had directed us in the gardens, he said it was impossible that green had been one of the colours of the old royal liveries long since discarded. Then I spent a day at the Bibliothèque Nationale going over the printed maps of the palace gardens of the past 60 years. Yes. Although the paths have been altered from time to time, I could find no relation between what we saw and... Uh, and how they used to be. Mm. It was hot. We were lost. But you don't believe that is the explanation. Was there anything else? Well? The plough that was lying on the ground... Yeah, I did not see it. But you will remember my sketch. Uh, here. It is apparently of 18th century design. No plough is kept there now, but one was regularly used from 1774 to 1781 when crops were grown in an area to the east of the Petit Trianon. Here is a list of my, uh, my printed sources. Thank you. No one I spoke to had seen such a design before. And then I read in number seven of the, of the source list here mm. that during the revolution, an old plough from the Petit Trianon had been sold with the king's other properties. One of the librarians in the Bibliothèque Nationale found me a picture of that old plough. I had it copied. Here. And here is my own sketch of the plough I saw when we... that I saw last week. They're identical. Yes. You've written a report. Not yet. Kindly do so this afternoon. I was intending to move into my room this afternoon. The carrier has delivered my trunks. Uh, th I, I, this evening, then? I may be going out this evening. Out? For a walk. A walk? What do you mean, a walk? With whom? Just a walk, Miss Morrison. I shall write my report ce soir. Of course, she can be a frightful bully. I think she's a very lonely woman, in need of Christian affection. She's certainly in need of something. <laughs> She tolerates me as visiting chaplain solely because only a man can give communion. Otherwise, I'm not out near the place. <laughs> if she had her way, all men would walk around ringing a bell and crying, Unclean! <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, whatever. Oh, it's good to see you. You can imagine how good it is for me. And now you won't have to write to me every day. Oh, don't tease. I'm so grateful to you for proposing me for this position. It's a ghastly mistake for me. When I moved away from your father's parish, it was intended to be a complete break. Dear Oliver... Oh, no, stop it. Please stop it. You know how foolish I become. But I do come alive when I see you. Oh, what a lovely thing to say. Well, it's true. I can't help it. I wish I could. 
me more about Miss Morrison. Uh, she's basically uneducated. Mm -hmm. What she learned was largely picked up from her brother's tutors and listening to her father. You oh. know who he was, I assume. Could anyone not know? <laughs> well, she got the job here centuries ago. When St. Hughes was simply a hall of residence, and all they needed was a woman of impeccable Christian uprightness to run it. But over the years, it's, it's changed into an academic institution in its own right. I think she feels inadequate as a result, and counters this by her continual domineering and bullying. Well, I suspect she's quite different underneath. How clever of you to have worked it all out. <sighs> You're teasing again. I may need your help with her, Oliver. Hmm? Would you help me? You know the answer to that. Oh, and I'd like you to read something of great interest. My notes on something very odd, which happened when we were at Versailles. When we get back, will you come to my room? What? To see the notes. Uh, I'd like you to see my new bedroom in any case. Just you and I? Wouldn't you like that? But, <clears throat> I mean, would it be proper? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Um, there, I think. Have you received the registrar's letter about your appointment? I would prefer people to knock before entering my room. Mm. And have you replied? With my acceptance, yes, of course. So it is now a legal contract? I assume so. And you have no further reason for appearing to agree with me when in fact you do not? Miss Morrison? I must ask. It is important. I'm not the foolishly imperceptive woman I'm sometimes taken to be. I assume you are referring to our experiences at Versailles? Of course, naturally. Well, then, I have no desire or reason to pretend about these matters. Quite the reverse. Good. Because I find this information in your account about the existence of a Creole courtier at Marie Antoinette's court of particular interest. The Comte de Vaudreuil. A Creole whose face was marked by smallpox. A close personal friend of the Queen's, frequently at Versailles. Obviously, the evil-looking man on the steps by the little pavilion. Obviously? I think we should be quite frank with each other, Miss Lamont. I should like to know your opinion of... <laughs> the paranormal is, I believe, the fashionable phrase. I have never had a psychic experience. All forms of occultism appear unwholesome to me. We're both daughters of English clergymen, so I'm certain that your feelings are as mine on this subject. Emphatically. Nevertheless, there is too great a body of scientific evidence to support the possibility of such things to be able to dismiss them altogether. Evidence? Sir Patrick Corcoran has photographed apparitions in his laboratory. Mr. Balfour is a publicly declared believer. So is Lord Tennyson, a Dr. John Quayle, a Mr. Ruskin. My own position is one of acute scepticism. As a churchwoman? Yes. And as a scholar? As a scholar, Miss Morrison? What science lacks, what it has always lacked, is a perfectly documented example of a psychic manifestation described in precise detail by scholarly observers. Indeed. Such a thing would be an immense contribution to learning. An academic event of the first importance. It might even help to refute Darwin. But are we really qualified to investigate such things? Who better qualified? I, I, I believe there's a scientific body devoted to examining... The Society for Psychical Research, yes. I have obtained its address. We will interview its officers and decide whether to allow them to publish our evidence. Meanwhile... What do you think we saw? I beg your pardon? What do you think is the explanation for what happened. I think it is conceivable that we, in some way, peeped through a curtain of time. We understand as little about time as in the 15th century was understood about gravity. Someone has to stumble upon the key. A new Galileo, a, a, a Newton, the apple falling on his head. If that's the explanation, why do you suppose you saw things which I did not? My father was a bishop, Miss Lamont. Haven't you 
finished it? I'm on the last page. <sighs> well. What do you think? I think you should drop it. What? Eleanor, Miss Morrison has no idea of what constitutes scientific evidence. Your case will be ridiculed. Oh, but, but surely if we were to... There would be a stink. It would reach the nostrils of congregation, which would then reject your application to join the university on the grounds that both the principal and the vice-principal were unbalanced. I thought you were my friend. And so I am. That is why I say what I do. Dear Oliver, what exactly did Miss Morrison say at the trustees' meeting about when she intended to retire? You know that's confidential. Oh, but you can tell me. You put me in a very difficult position, Eleanor. Surely not, my dear. Do you know, I've never seen Blenheim Palace, and I'd so like to. It's not far away, is it? Ten miles. Well, would you take me one day soon? Why don't we take a picnic? You can hire a gig, and I'll arrange the food and wine. It'll be a lovely day together. Oh, Eleanor. And I promise, not a word about any of this. <laughs> oh, no, 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 Miss Benson. Charles V did not build the Hofburg. Mm. Why was one pound nineteen shillings and sixpence moved from Miss Anderson's buttery account to her fee account last February? It must be obvious. Not to me. Show me. Hmm. And the preceding page? Oh, there, you see? It was to pay for her viva voce. Oh. Of course, you wouldn't be used to such things at your school, would you? Never be afraid to ask if there's anything you don't understand, my dear. I've become fond of you. Is it true that your retirement could be delayed? Most unlikely. But possible? In certain circumstances. It would be unfair of me to hand over total responsibility to you until the status of the college has been resolved. Where will you live when you retire? I've taken rooms in Charlbury Road. Is that far? Two minutes' walk. I see. So, I shall always be on hand if required. I should like you to feel you could call round to consult me on any problem. Thank you. And um, I shall look in here from time to time to assist wherever I can. Oh, good. <clears throat> uh, by the way, I should uh, like to return to Watford for a day next week, if you don't mind. The school is making me a farewell presentation. Which day? Um, Wednesday. Oh, dear. Is that inconvenient? I had a letter from the Society for Psychical Research this morning. Wednesday's the only day they can meet us. Oh. Never mind. I could easily postpone the presentation. I wouldn't hear of it. Very well. I shall miss you. Morrison, how do you do? How very good of you to come. Uh, my name is Cecilia Huxley, and I am the Society's research officer. I was expecting to meet the secretary, Mr. Arthur. Uh, Mr. Arthur sends his apologies. Unfortunately, when you had to alter your appointment from Thursday to Wednesday, he was already engaged. The principal of a great Oxford college cannot always predict when she will be at liberty, Miss Huxley. Oh, no, indeed. <laughs> I am Dr. Huxley, by the way. Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, Dr. Doctor? Uh, the University of Heidelberg has no problems with women's education. Uh, do please be seated. Thank you. Now, I've, uh, I've read your account and examined your sketches. Most diverting. 
But why come to us? Well, surely you investigate such matters. We're a scientific body, not a spook association. Of course not. Nor are we spiritualists, table wrappers, ectoplasmicists, crystal gazers, or any of those fellows. I do understand. Though I have often said we should practice clairvoyance. It would save us so much on postage. <laughs> but I'm not at all sure this case is one for us, however. Why not? Uh, because you were at Versailles by yourself. That weakens the objective scientific value of your evidence. Well, I, um, I wasn't entirely by myself. N not by yourself? My vice-principal, Miss Lamont, was with me. Uh, you do not mention that in your paper. Did she also have these experiences? Some of them. Did she write them up? Yes, but... Uh, oh, well then. <laughs> uh, uh, but as she did not see all the things I saw, mine is the only complete account. Uh, nevertheless, the evidence is far stronger with two uh, by the ordinary logic of investigation. Um, if we decide to investigate this case, we guarantee absolute anonymity. You realise that? I see. A small paragraph to report the matter in our monthly journal will give no clue as to who you were. I'm sure you would wish that. Yes, yes, I, I relieved. I will, in the circumstances, suggest to the research committee that they should interview you to ascertain if there is a case worthy of investigation. Worthy of investigation? Oh, no reflection on you, my dear Miss Morrison, but on your, uh, your methods of observation and record. My academic integrity has never been questioned in my life. Oh, no, 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 of course not. And my father, the, the Bishop bi of Salisbury... Oh, you were aware of that? Indeed, yes, my brother-in-law mentioned it only this morning. Your brother-in-law? The Archbishop of York. Good afternoon, Miss Morrison. Good afternoon, Miss Morrison. Good afternoon. I would like to speak to you alone, if you please. Of course. Uh, thank you, everyone. We will continue another time. Good afternoon, Good afternoon Mr. Mont. That girl has a remarkable voice. She, she should be encouraged what to... What on earth was all that about? I beg your pardon? All those students in your room. I was holding a little soiree. A soiree? I get to know them so much better when we can talk as friends. Is this to be another of your innovations? I understand you've been announcing yourself as something of a new broom about my college. Miss Morrison, Is it I correct that you lent your personal copy of Dyer's The Fleece to Miss Benson and that it contained a dried pressed flower, a memento you claimed of some past romantic attachment? Alice Benson is a remarkable... Alice! Thing. Did you say Alice? It is my custom to use Christian names in tutorials. I see no reason why not, and every reason the why... The registrar informs me that you've been very free with comments to cook about the menus of meals provided in the dining room. Only the dessert. It seemed to me monotonous to have the same thing. Monotonous? Here. Cold blancmange covered with hundreds of thousands for pudding every day. And what is wrong, may one ask, with blancmange covered with hundreds of thousands? Nothing but the lack of variety. Hundreds of thousands are nutritious. And blancmange is based upon milk, than which there is no healthier food. It appears that you are dissatisfied with the way this establishment has been run these past 20 years. If I am to be principal here... You I... are vice-principal, vice-principal. My appointment is to succeed you as principal. Ah, an appointment which can always be rescinded. But that's not for you to say, is it? I beg your pardon. I was appointed by the Academic Board of Trustees, and only they can remove me. Which I would think highly likely the way you've begun... Where were you, may one ask, at 11.30 this morning? I presume I was engaged in whatever my time... You were engaged to hold a tutorial with Miss Fish. But Miss Fish informs me you cancelled it without explanation. At 11.30, you were observed in the Botanic Gardens in the company of Mr Hodgson. 
arm in arm with Mr. Hodgson and talking to Mr. Hodgson in a manner which can only be described as intimate. May one inquire if you're in the habit of meeting him? I would have thought that was entirely my business. Then you would be wrong. You are vice principal, he is visiting chaplain, and your intimacies took place in public. My... Mr. Hodgson was one of my father's best-loved curates. Best loved. Huh. So what could be more natural than that we should meet and talk? Sneaking off in your secret activities. I was not sneaking. At 11.30 you were engaged to hold a tutorial. Miss Fish reported us. Uh, I beg your pardon. Was it Miss Fish who observed Oliver and me in the botanic... Oliver? Yes, Oliver. Oliver, he's an old friend and I call him Oliver. Even worse than I feared. Did it Miss Fish... I am not prepared to discuss Miss Fish. Was there anything else... Oh, I'm sorry, my dear. Is there anything else we should discuss? I get so stupid. And in a harouche with myself. Not at all. Will you forgive me? Oh, uh, uh, of course. Now, is no, there... please, please, forgive a stupid old woman. I'm so sorry, dear Miss Lamont. Everyone is so fond of you. Let me kiss you, please. Oh. Oh, I, I actually came to tell you that I've, um, I've heard from the Society for Psychical Research again. Yes? From Miss uh, Dr. Huxley. She says, if it is convenient, the research committee will materialise at St Hugh's College at three o'clock on Sunday afternoon. Is that convenient for you, my dear? Perfectly convenient. I shall put them in the senior common room. I should like to tell you what Oliver said to me. I really don't want to hear. It's important. And nothing whatever to do with me. He's been to Versailles. What? He's deeply concerned at our position, as he calls it, and he went to Versailles to look for himself. You told him of our experiences. I did. We agreed not to tell. It seemed essential to obtain his opinion. You should have stopped him. I had no idea he was going. He said that... If he has opinions to offer on this matter, I should prefer to hear them for myself. Yes, Mr. Hodgson? I think there's a perfectly rational solution. On your first visit, you took one path, and on Miss Lamont's second, she took another. Hence the discrepancies of building and so forth. You saw nothing but buildings and scenery that in fact exist. And the persons you saw were such gardeners and tourists as may be seen about the Petit Trianon at any time. The heat confused you. I've summarised my observations and conclusions in these notes and this map. Your kiosk, or pavilion, is, in fact, a building here, known as the Belvedere. A little bridge you crossed was the Pont du Rocher, here. We were nowhere near those places. Oh, I think you were. You believed you took this route. In fact, you took this. It was the heat. Ah. Do you not think we considered this? You considered it. And rejected it. It leaves too much unexplained. I agree it does not explain everything, but... I do beg of you to drop this matter. I beg of you. I understand you are to meet the Society for Psychical Research on Sunday. Sir Patrick Cochrane is to question you personally. At least allow him to consider my arguments. Thank you, Mr Hodgson. You are getting yourself into a position from which there is no retreat. And that will jeopardise other matters that are very much more important. I, I beg you to show them my conclusions. You may safely leave them with me, sir. And I will treat them with the consideration they deserve.
But you did discuss it between you, Miss Morrison, before writing your accounts. Briefly. You discussed detail. We discovered, Sir Patrick, that I had observed things Miss Lamont had not. Oh, dear. But we wrote our accounts and drew our maps quite independently. And your sketches and watercolours? Done immediately. The same night? Uh, no, but... Uh, well, mine were done two days later, uh, Miss Morrison's three. Thank you. A three days' delay made no difference. My memory was entirely clear. I do not doubt it. Uh, the, 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 the lady you saw sketching... Uh, I saw her. Miss Lamont did not. How many times did you see her? Twice. Once when you passed her and once when you looked back from the terrace of the Petitriano? Yes. And which of these two occasions does this watercolour of yours represent? The first. Uh, you're certain? Quite certain. She is wearing a white fichu over a green bodice with a little line of gold near the edge. Now, are you sure it was a single fichu? Yes. Quite positive? Quite positive. Uh, may, may I show the research committee these? Mm. Uh, they're leaves from a journal of Madame Eloff, the Queen's milliner, uh, which we have had copied photographically from the original manuscript. She says that in 1789, the Queen had very few dresses made, but in July and September of that year, two green silk bodices and many large white single fichus were made for Her Majesty. There was also a skirt of very light yellow. She included a sketch of these, indicating the Queen's exact measurements. There. You see? You will observe that it agrees in every way with the Principal's watercolour. Mm. Uh, you had never seen this, Miss Morrison? No. What is your knowledge of French history? I'm afraid, poor. The fichu is different to that shown in this other picture. Here, the Queen is in similar dress. It is a print by Rubiac. I have the fichu as I saw it. I do not doubt it. Miss Lamont, mm -hmm. do you think the date on which you had these experiences is significant? Uh, the, the date you were at Versailles? No. On that very same day, in 1792, the massacres were at their height. The French Revolution. 1,400 state prisoners horribly butchered in their cells. The Queen herself feared the same end. Uh, you were not aware of this? No. What we saw was nothing like such things. But violent convulsions of that type have been known to produce curious echoes on a psychic level to those sensitive to them. Not necessarily of the events themselves. And what we saw did have a... an incoherence, a disjointed quality about it. The, the idea of echoes. Yes, as if we'd somehow entered into someone's imperfect memory of those events. Mm. Ah, yes. <laughs> Perhaps Marie Antoinette's own memory as she remembered it. There is, we've discovered, a popular belief that a messenger was sent to the Trianon to warn the Queen of the approach of the mob from, from Paris. She wished to walk back to the palace by the most direct route, but the messenger begged her not to, saying, um, I've noted it, saying, Non, madame, il ne faut pas passer par là, par ici, cherchez la maison. Exactly what your running man, as you call him, said to you. Yes. <laughs> but your watercolour, it is not exactly a close likeness of Marie Antoinette. Not a familiar likeness, no. I don't quite follow you. May I show you one of the illustrations from Hibbertson's biography of the Queen? It's, it's a, a print of the picture of her painted by Wertmuller. I quote from the text. Wertmuller's portrait of the Queen was unpopular at court because it did not idealise Marie Antoinette as so many other paintings did, but in fact it had the merit of being the most perfect likeness of her. You see? Exactly like the watercolour. Yes. I have saved the most interesting evidence until last. As part of our researches, we naturally examined every ancient map of the gardens at Versailles we could find. Only last week I received a photographic copy of the most interesting of these maps showing the gardens as they were laid out in 1785. I, uh, I have it here. You seem surprised, Miss Lamont. Uh, 
I, I, I know nothing of this. The original was found only six months ago in a house in Montmorency. The chimney was being swept when down it fell, charred by smoke and flames, as you can see. It was evidently being used as stuffing for the chimney lining. It was sent to the director of the Bibliothèque Nationale, who, knowing of my researches, wrote to me about it. Now, it shows the paths with absolute clarity. There, you see? Paths which were destroyed when the garden was redesigned in 1802. But why didn't you tell me that now, you received... Now, if you compare the... this map with our own sketch maps, you will see that on August the 10th this year, we were unquestionably following paths which had been destroyed nearly 100 years ago. I'm very sorry. Not pursue the inquiry. The committee felt... Not that publish. It can only take up cases where the evidence is absolutely watertight. But the Marie Antoinette print, the map... Discovered last June before you went to Versailles. But we hadn't seen it. Neither of us knew it existed. Nevertheless... Perhaps you are accusing us of lying. Oh, Miss, Miss Morrison... It's quite all right. I'm perfectly all right, thank you. I shall publish myself... I shall have it privately printed. I shall publish it under our own names from this college. No. What do you mean? How dare you? You may not publish it from this college. It would cause a scandal. Then let it, let it. It would get into the newspapers. At a time when we're seeking a charter of incorporation to the university, that would be suicidal. I will write a preface. I will refer to scholars all down the ages having to battle with ignorance, with superstition and refusal to face new evidence. Miss Morrison... A petition would be refused. I did see them. I did! ages, brave men have defied the world when the world tried to suppress a great discovery. Galileo appeared before the Inquisition and was tried for heresy because he asserted that the world was round. Such ignorance, such barbarity, though partly excusable, of course, because they were Roman Catholics. Martin Luther was very nearly burned at the stake for asserting truths that every English woman knows are plain common sense. And our blessed Saviour himself suffered, among other things, that the truth might be proclaimed throughout the world. And this tradition continues. Indeed, it is in our midst. In this very chapel, you will find copies of a new book, published anonymously, in which the learned authoresses describe in detail certain extraordinary experiences they had and draw scientific conclusions of incalculable importance. We must all fight and strive for the truth. Copies may be purchased at the back of the chapel for three shillings and sixpence, or three for ten shillings, next to the collecting box for the Society for the Propagation of Christian Knowledge among the Hottentots. Trustees will be concerned to learn that the Hebdomadal Council of the University has written to us to say they can make no decision about our petition for some months. Oh. <sighs> They understand that certain changes in command are contemplated at St. Hugh's and they wish to consider those changes. Is that a criticism of my appointment? Please continue, Registrar. They would also like to know more about the new research the College is said to be undertaking, as reported in the popular press. The popular press? 
Pray, what can they mean by that? I think... Pray write and inform the hebdomadal council that this establishment is a temple of learning. We do not peruse the popular press. It is widely believed that you yourself are engaged in certain researches. In my own time. My own time, registrar. And at my own expense. So I fail to see what it has to do with the hebdomadal council. As to the postponement of their decision, that clearly means I shall have to delay my retirement. Delay? A great vexation. But there we are. Are you quite certain that is what they mean? I beg your pardon? Well, their letter says... Uh... Uh, yes, I understand what their letter says, Mr Hodgson. They are fearful of changes at the helm after 20 years with one captain. That is what it says. But, my dear Miss Morrison, they know the old captain. Could it's... it not be that they wish to assess the new one? <laughs> They don't mean that at all. In that case, I'm afraid I must resign. If you must go, you must. I have never hidden my intention to stay on in certain circumstances. I'm sure no one wishes to detain you. One moment. Yes, come in. Forgive me, but it is important. Yes. The trustees wish me to put a certain proposal to you. They feel that what they know of your investigations could be of immense importance to science. They would be honoured if you would allow the college to finance further work along these lines. Indeed. Provided you allow sufficient time for the preparation of anything so important. Provided, in fact, that I step down from the principalship. My dear, it would be a step up. If this work is as important as we all believe it to be, you could become the college's first fellow and a scholar of European repute. How much more an achievement that would be than mere administration. And what a crown to your career. I could stay in constant touch. We would provide your new rooms in Charbury Road with a telephone and a full-time research secretary and a substantial endowment. I will consider it. Uh, but what do we do? The authoress's identity is an open secret. Not altogether open. Surely, in academic circles. Well, within the university, yes. That is what I fear. <laughs> the society must publicly state its position on the book. There is virtually a direct challenge to do so in the preface. If we ignore it, we could be accused of prevarication over one of the best publicised examples of exactly what we set out to investigate. Mm. But they are not reliable witnesses. And the method by which they draw their conclusions is ridiculous. Winning over academic opinion to our value as a scientific body is of the utmost importance. We shall have to respond. Hmm. Mm, very well. I'll review them. Yes. Uh, perhaps you, Dr. Huxley, would draft a review which we should all approve and then publish it quickly. <laughs> Eleanor Hilda Constance Lamont receive the commission of the Academic Board of Trustees of St. Hugh's College, Oxford, and be installed as principal of this place. 
Do you freely and willingly accept their commission? I do, freely and willingly. May the Lord bless you and give you his peace and his guidance in the tasks that lie ahead. Have you seen this review? It is usual to knock before entering the principal's room. But this review of our book in the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research? A copy was sent to me. A personal attack on our integrity and reliability as witnesses. <gasps> that wretched Huxley woman. Dr Huxley, indeed. It also accuses us of failing to carry out essential research. Ridiculous. No, no, she has a point. The matters she lists here. It's quite true, we didn't cover everything. How dare she question our integrity? How dare she? We shall become the laughing stock of Oxford. Well, it's unfortunate that Oxford knows so much about the identity of the authors. We will write to the society demanding a retraction and an apology. No. But it is defamatory. But we're not actually named. Neither in the book nor in the review, so we have no ground to pursue. I've ascertained that by my telephone. My solicitor is quite certain. You have a telephone? Certainly. Just installed. There it is. I'm not going to start my principalship of this college under a slur like this. You must return to Versailles and carry out the research which we are accused of omitting. But, uh, I don't speak French. You'll get by. Together. We should go together. As to the libel, we will write a letter to the Times, publicly declaring ourselves to be the authors and demanding a retraction and an apology. Yes? Oh, Sir Patrick. You've seen the Times. Well, it's brave of them. Yeah, I would say foolhardy. Oxford must be appalled. I'm told the level of senior common room hum has gone up about three octaves. <laughs> yeah. All the old dreadnoughts who oppose women's colleges are wallowing in it. Uh, what should we do? Nothing. Nothing? We should have had the review read by a solicitor. That, I admit, was a mistake. It never crossed my mind. But it was our honest opinion. We have nothing to retract. They won't leave it at that. Principal, I, I, I went Sit to down, a... Alexandra. S sit down? Yes, please. Uh, we always stood when, um... Oh, thank you. Mm. I, I, I went to Mr Walter's chambers this afternoon mm. about the conveyancing of the new hall of residence. Oh, yes. The engrossment will be ready for signature on Friday. Mr. Walter's clerk will bring it round. Good. I I've arranged for the decorators to start on Monday morning. It should only be three weeks before some of the students from Robson Wing can move in. Thank you. Um, Is there something else? Uh, Mr. Walter's... Uh, I hope Mr. Walter's did not discuss my private affairs. He's issuing a writ for you and Miss Morrison against that society. I didn't say anything, but I could see he was terribly worried. It was another member of his staff who told me. Oh, it's not true, is it, Miss Lamont? Please, we are so fond of you. It's the new telephone. We all have to get used to it. Calm down. Alexandra, please, calm down. Hello? Yes? Yes, Mr Walters. Uh, Topping Neaton Smithson said it is an interesting <laughs> point of law. Our review names no one. And had the two ladies not subsequently invited trouble by coming out into the open, there would have been no writ. But do they think we have a case? Well, they do, yes. We should fight on two grounds. First, they are blowing the whole thing up out of all proportion. And second, that the words complained of were not actually defamatory when the review appeared. Because nobody officially knew they were responsible. Yes. Uh, yet it was a commonly held belief in Oxford, yes. Mm, it's a curious point. So, what are our alternatives? Uh, either to apologise, withdraw and pay their costs, 
or defend the action. Or dragging us through the law courts? Mm. That would be a terrible scandal. But if we back away... We would lose all probity in the eyes of the academic world. Exactly. <sighs> then we have no choice. A date has actually been set down in three months' time in the High Court. Do you really think we should go that far? But we discussed this. And now there's more. The music we heard has been identified by the Conservatoire de Musique of Paris. I received a letter from them this morning. Um, oh. oh, it's so awkward holding this machine in one hand. I wish I were there with you. Here it is. The music I heard was 12 bars from an unpublished ballet by Gretry, who died in 1813. My transcription was completely accurate. But surely, our point has been made. The book is out, our arguments put. We... What's happened? What? Did something happen at Versailles? I covered all the points we discussed. Uh, when can you come round? Tomorrow. I am, um... I, I'm rather troubled about some of it. Oh, I hate the telephone. I wish I could see you. Troubled? What about? Good night, my dear. Uh, now, uh, how, how do I... How do I... Wait! Wait! Oh. Come in. Miss Lamont. The senior staff wonders if you realize we have newspaper reporters at the very gates of the college. They're even accosting the young ladies as they go out. Then call the police. <gasps> the police? They have no right whatsoever to be we there. We have been working for admission to the university for 20 years. And in one term you have destroyed everything. Anything that I have done has been done entirely as a private citizen. Well, the only chance that now remains for our petition is for you to withdraw your high court action. It's the only chance. No. Then we have no choice. We shall apply to the university's chancellor, Lord Kettlestone. He has no jurisdiction. I'm afraid he has. He can investigate anything he chooses in the affairs of a college that has applied for incorporation. Then let him. Uh, Principal, may I speak with you alone for a moment? Will the registrar and the rest of you please leave? Eleanor, please listen to me. I'm sorry that it will not be possible to renew your engagement as our chaplain. What? Your employment here is reviewed every three years, I believe. Uh, Eleanor, listen. I'm sure you'll have no trouble finding a new position. The one important thing is to keep our nerve. The one important thing. Lord Kettleston will interview us both, together and separately. I am no longer principal. No, but you're still involved in the affairs of the college. He will try everything he can to get us to retract. You've met him? No. He is, of course, brilliant. He was a pupil of my father's at Winchester, Attorney General at only 36. I know, I know. Miss Lamont, the one essential is to stick like limpets to what we know to be true. If we waver, we will lose and be wholly discredited. Miss Lamont, are uh, these your uh, new notes and sketches? Eleanor! What? Listen to me. There is a man. There is a man who lives at Versailles, the Comte de Montesquieu. His house is on the borders of the palace gardens, and he has access to them, a gate from his own garden. Yes? He is a... an exquisite... A what? A degenerate. It is his custom to hold tableau vivant of his male friends. Some of them... Uh, oh, heavens. Some of them... Some of them dress up as women. Oh, I don't understand these things, but they dress up in all sorts of peculiar clothes. There was to be a public performance for charity a week after our visit. A week after? Yes. Might there not have been a rehearsal? But I spoke to the superintendent of works himself. About performances. And rehearsals. He said there were definitely no rehearsals. But as there was a gate, 
direct from his garden. I know it doesn't fit all the facts, but who would believe us now? Oh! I've never enjoyed a book more. My wife is bored with my constantly quoting from it. It's, it's astute, deeply impressive, and reaches conclusions of the highest importance. I congratulate you most sincerely. Thank you, Chancellor. Would you sign my copy? Sign it, Lord Cuddleston. Yes, autograph it for me. I would so value that. Thank you. Tell me... Have you had any experience of this nature before? No. No psychic manifestation, ghostly voices? I don't believe in them. <laughs> really? Thank you. This was an isolated experience, which we recorded as carefully as we could. It is a model of clarity. And there's no possibility you might have been mistaken? No. Not the teeniest crack? No. Excellent. Tell me, what do you think about Miss Morrison? Think about her? Her integrity, her reliability as a witness. She's a woman of strong character. She saw things you did not. Yes. What was your attitude to that? I agreed at first, but later made my position clear. Why did you agree at first? <sighs> this is in confidence. Totally. Absolutely. I was being sounded out for the post of principal. Here, I did not wish to seem... Uncooperative? Inflexible. You were humouring an old fool? No. I do beg your pardon. She's become a very dear friend. You love her? I... Uh, yes, I do. You're a very ambitious woman, are you not? As you are a very ambitious man. Yes. But I don't see ghosts. But if you did... I should have kept quiet about them. Do you think Mr Gladstone would ever have made me Home Secretary if I told him I saw spooks? You see, I believe you. I, I, I do think you saw those things and that your book will prove to be a milestone of natural science. That's not the point. I also passionately believe in women's education. And it is essential that this college is accepted into the university. You wish me to withdraw my action for political expediency? Exactly, precisely. I know I can persuade the abdominal council to grant your petition if you do that. Remember, I'm on your side. Together we must defeat the old dreadnoughts who wish to obstruct us for the sake of all intelligent women. This is not a matter of truthfulness, but of strategy. Come now. Withdraw it. No. You know why I'm here? Yes. And why it's so important? Yes. Of course you do. With anyone else, I would use guile, flattery, diplomacy. But you're too intelligent to be deceived by those House of Commons tricks. Though I do do them rather well. I've heard you. You've attended debates. I particularly remember your closing speech on the India Bill. Pure fireworks. <laughs> yes, I did rather enjoy myself over that one. My father took me. You remember my father? Remember him? My goodness, I still quake to hear his name. He was a fearsome classics master, you know. And a magnificent bishop. A great man. A great man. A great man. And an excellent father, I have no doubt. He could be rather strict. Strict, of course. And he was not the easiest man to talk to. You astonish me. Oh, I assure you. I often tried to discuss things with him, but I never got very far. He thought, he felt, that I was a fool. Miss Morris. I'd never come to anything. I'd never do anything. But look at what you have done. Good gracious, look at this college, your college, which you've brought from nothing to the very brink of success. 
Which is why you're here. Which is why I'm here. I should like to ask you a favour. The present Bishop of Salisbury is a great friend of mine. Dr Salter? A dear man, Peter Salter, a dear fellow, he'd do anything for me. I would like the honour of writing the preface to the second edition of your book. And I would like Peter to preach about it in Salisbury Cathedral. Lord Kettleston... Don't say anything now. Just think about it, will you? Copies will be sold at the cathedral bookshops and at all the bookshops throughout Salisbury. If your father were still alive, that'd make him think again, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, it would. But then the whole climate of opinion about women's capabilities is changing. Within our lifetime, we shall have women MPs, women doctors, women bishops. Do you really think so? I have no doubt. Provided those responsible play their cards correctly at this stage. No! I'm talking about strategy, Miss Morrison. Simple politics. I ask only one thing. Drop my High Court action. Yes. No. I was sorry to learn, Mr Hodgson, that you and St Hugh's College are part company. Yes. How long have you been visiting Chaplin? Three years. You were unhappy in the appointment? I felt the time had come to move on. But the principal, the new principal, is an old friend of yours, is she not? You are well informed, sir. And she applied for the position. She may even have been appointed to it at your instigation. I informed her of the vacancy which was to occur. One would think she would feel a sense of obligation and gratitude towards you. Doubtless she pressed you to stay for a further three years. And you refused? I have decided to move on. Indeed. Uh, to what? That has yet to be decided. That is very brave of you. Another college chaplaincy, perhaps. Um, Oriel College will have a vacancy later this year. Oriel's a very agreeable college, you know, and the position is that of resident chaplain with some charming rooms. I was not aware it was in your gift, Chancellor. In my gift? <laughs> Good gracious. Of course it isn't. But uh, colleges tend not to brush aside any suggestion their Chancellor may make to them and any names he may mention. Perhaps you have a price. Ah, I like you, Mr. Hodgson. You should be in the House of Commons. I would not describe it as a price, but as working with me, arm in arm, so to speak, to advance the cause of women's education. That is something in which I suspect you believe. Yes. Excellent. But I cannot bring any pressure on Miss Lamont. Pressure? Good gracious, no such concept crossed my mind. But perhaps you could enlighten me. How would you describe the relationship between Miss Morrison and Miss Lamont? What can you mean, sir? Good friends? They have become, sir. I need to be in possession, sir, of any information which will act as a wine press. If you and I, together, are to advance the cause of women, which is what they wish to, opposition must be crushed, crushed in the wine press. Now, however painful it may be for you and whatever courage you will need to display, I want you to write me an account, as seen from your cardinal position at St Hugh's in recent months, which I can use. In what way? As my wine press. Blackmail. Politics, my dear sir. Politics. The ends always justify the means. And the ends are what they want. Come now. An appointment worthy of the moral steel within you that you would have demonstrated would surely follow. Good afternoon, Chancellor. Mr. Hodgson, we must talk further. Wait!
Do you realise you're obstructing not just your own lives and careers, but those of all the students in your charge? Do you comprehend with what obliquy and detestation your names will be held if you persist? You are asking us to lie. Oh, don't be childish. To pretend it didn't happen. I'm asking you to, to do something magnificent for which your names will be blessed forevermore. You do realise what will happen if you do not? Hmm? I should recommend in my report that you are removed from the principalship, Miss Lamont, and that your endowment is cut off, Miss Morrison. The college would then be accepted into the university, but you would be no part of it at all. You... You, you would not do such a thing. No. Nope. You see, these hands, these hands have signed so many death warrants, I cannot number them. Do you think they would hesitate to remove two foolish women who are obstructing so much? I ask you, for the last time, withdraw your case. Pig's piss. What? Pig's puddle. Cowpat. The Chancellor of the University, having been invited by the Academic Board of Trustees of St. Hugh's College to adjudicate on certain matters pertaining to the future of the college, greatly regrets that he must report the following findings and make the following recommendations. In every life, there comes a time for courage. A time when you must stand up and declare what you believe at the top of your voice. However painful, however inconvenient, no matter what the consequences, or life is simply not worth living. I came to this college after 20 years of hard work, rising at four each morning, Rarely getting to bed before 11 at night. Toiling, grinding, to educate myself, to, to, to pull myself out of the genteel ecclesiastical poverty into which I was born. And I became principal of this college before my 40th birthday. And that means more to me than most of you can begin to understand. I've held this post for less than a year because I stood up for what I believed. And now you have got rid of me. Oh, how much you would have preferred a comfortable, comforting principal who caused you no scandal. This is my farewell sermon, and sermons should impart a thought, leave a message which will give strength and vision to those who follow. Do I have such a message as I leave this place? Yes, I do. A very clear one. I'm worth more than the lot of you put together! You can have the room upstairs at the back, Eleanor, if you wish. You remember it? Yes. The porters can bring round your things from the college tomorrow. These rooms were not designed for two occupants, but uh, I'm sure we can manage. Why did you have to tell me? What, my dear? About the Comte de Montesquieu. Because it's what happened. I don't believe it to be an explanation of what we saw, but... Who would believe us once that were known? Exactly. Politics, in a way. <laughs> I'm just going up to have a little lie down in my new room, Annie. The room you're so kindly allowing me. I'm so tired. Dear old Oxford, 
foam of lost causes and forsaken beliefs. I'll bring you up a cup of tea later. Thank you. What you said in chapel was splendid. Splendid. <laughs> Once I have laughed at the power of love, and twice at the grip of the grave, and thrice have I patted my God on the head, that men might call me brave. Thank you, Cabby, and that's for you. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, Registrar. Registrar, have you seen the Times? Mr. Hodgson. The Society for Psychical Research, they've dropped their case. Yes. They say it was costing them too much. Look, here. Mr. Hodgson, Miss Lamont is dead. What? Found dead in her bed last night. You'd better come in, Sir Patrick. Thank you. Miss Morrison, I... Yes? We were deeply shocked. The Society sends its profoundest condolences. Thank you. And for the wreath. Hmm. I take it that it was totally unexpected? May I ask? Natural you? causes. Indeed. Natural causes. Mm. You, you know we have withdrawn from the High Court action. We're paying all costs. And we are entering the details of the case in our monthly journal. Indeed. Yes. <clears throat> We think there is now sufficient evidence to... Uh... <laughs> yes, we'll... Uh... Excuse me. Sir Patrick. Yes? We did see them. I do not doubt it. We did see them. No doubt at all. We saw them. We did see them. Very well. In Miss Morrison's Ghosts by Ian Curtis, Miss Morrison was played by Patricia Hodge, Miss Lamont by Juliet Stevenson, Lord Kettleston by Robert Hardy, and Mr. Hodgson by Toby Longworth. Sir Patrick Corcoran was played by Christopher Benjamin, Dr. Cecilia Huxley by Gemma Jones, and the College Registrar by Jenny Stoller. The French official was Daniel Pajon, Miss Lamont's student, Sarah Crook, and the singing student, Alison Pettit. The musical accompaniment was by Tim Wolfe. Technical presentation was by Paul Dealey, and the broadcast assistant was Tabitha Frankel. Miss Morrison's Ghosts by Ian Curtis was a BBC World Service drama production directed by Dirk Max. introduced that drama earlier. I mentioned another play by Ian Curtis, the Falklands play, which was postponed from being broadcast for more than 15 years. Well, it also stars Patricia Hodge, this time as Margaret Thatcher, and it gets its four extra debut at the same time next weekend. Coming soon to Radio 4 Extra, Mystery Theatre, starring Humphrey Bogart. You uh, think you're pretty tough, don't you, Ricky? In my modest, unassuming way, I try to hold my own. Followed by an account of his life and career. Bogart and Bacall weren't just mates. They were a match. Oh, you're a mess, aren't you? Mm. I'm not very tall, either. Next time I'll come on stilts, wear a white tie and carry a tennis racket. Mystery Theatre and Film Star with Humphrey Bogart on BBC Radio 4 Extra. Good night, Mr Leland. No, don't go. Let's talk. 
tomorrow morning at 11 and again in the evening at 7. The digital station for comedy, drama and entertainment. BBC Radio 4 Extra. Michael Benteen, born in 1922, died in 1996. He recorded this series in 1993, looking back on his career, and in this episode he nails down the moment he actually properly received his comic inspiration. It's The Reluctant Jester. Ladies and gentlemen,